in the beginning, part four. Genesis, introduction to the canon and to biblical theology. Um, the book we've been reviewing is uh, In the Beginning, Science and Scripture Confirm Creation. Um, and uh, it's uh, uh, edited by Brian Ball, uh, who was born in England, uh, got his MA in religion from Andrews, PhD from the University of London. Apparently a number of people did this. Was a uh, held a number of church offices and then uh, became principal of Ad Avondale College and then finally president of the South Pacific Division. Um, he's married to Don and has three children. That's uh, the bio that he gives for himself. Um, <clears throat> the book itself was written from a perspective that views scripture as decisive as the uh, Introduction says, its authority takes precedence over all other sources of information concerning origins. So therefore, the book itself is mostly about theology. It's evidence for the faithful uh, transmission of the text, argument against higher criticism, and for a view consonant with Jesus in the New Testament. It does include scientific chapters by Tim Standish, Grenville Kent, John Walton, James Gibson, and our own Ariel Roth. It also deals with theistic evolution and evolutionary morality. Um, did a little digging on uh, Ross Cole. I have uh, none of the people that are in here do I have a bio, uh, uh, do they have a, a biography on, and Ross Cole was a blank to me before I uh, started looking him up, although it turns out he shouldn't have been. He got his BA in at Pacific Union College, his MA at Andrews University, his PhD at Andrews University, and uh, he is currently listed as senior lecturer at Avondale Adventist University. I'm not sure exactly what that means, although looking at the listing, it looks like he's uh, just about uh, right next to the department chairman, so I assume that is something like a professor. Um, he taught at Pacific Adventist University in Papua New Guinea for a while. And while he was there, he wrote a, a, a number of, of uh, pieces for uh, Andrews University Seminary Studies. Um, but this one in particular caught my eye, The Christian in Timekeeping in Colossians 2.16 and Galatians 4.10. Uh, given that my master's thesis was on Colossians 2.16, I went to look at it and um, see if I can get this up for you. Uh, there. Uh, in the middle of this, I found, on the, on the other hand, it is not necessary to interpret Colossians 2.16.17 as opposition to any sort of calendrical observance. If Colossians 2.16 does refer to the practice of the opponents of the Colossians and of Paul, um, it does not necessarily follow that the Colossians do not have, the Colossians do not have positive counterparts, I presume, for the things that are being condemned. Desmond Ford notes that the apostle is not opposed to all eating and drinking, Although he says in Colossians 2.16, let no one judge you either in eating and drinking. He then suggests neither is he, the, Colossians, the author of Colossians, against all Sabbath keeping. That was, by the way, uh, 1981, if you want to put it in perspective as to where Desmond Ford's thought has gone. Another interpreter points out that when the elements of the calendar in Colossians 2.16 are listed sequentially in the Old Testament, special sacrificial offerings prescribed for the sacred times are in view rather than the days themselves. It is beyond the scope of this article to explore the implications of these suggestions in detail. And if you scroll down, you will notice that uh, reference 26 is my article in uh, Andrews University. Uh, and then he finishes up to say, to the extent that the author of Colossians himself may have seen the Sabbath as predating sacrifice and offering, there would appear to be no basis for seeing Colossians 2.16 as a rejection of Sabbath keeping in its entirety. 
So that was uh, kind of a little sidelight that, uh, that uh, I found interesting. Um, um, Cole starts his um, uh, chapter by saying, it is a well-known fact that the Bible is not actually a single book, but a library of many different pieces. Yet in the midst of this diversity, believers assert a deep unity, which even in the case of Genesis itself, is today being reaffirmed by many biblical scholars. Uh, to continue, uh, most of what I'll be doing, there's a few paraphrases, most of it will be actual quotes, but obviously I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, trying to give you the, the most salient points that he's making. Uh, Genesis provides much more than a chronological starting point. Uh, why is Genesis the first book in the scriptures? In a profound sense, it introduces the story and theology of scriptures as a whole. Indeed, without the orientation it provides, there are important parts of the rest so subtle in their expression that we might overlook them altogether. These assertions especially apply to the so-called primeval history of Genesis 1.11. Ironically, the portion of the book that to most modern and postmodern readers alike seems the most fantastic and least historical of all. Um, Cole gives 11 vital orienting themes in Genesis, especially in chapters 1 to 11. And they are the oneness of the sovereign God, the goodness of creation, the reality of cosmic conflict, the sinfulness of humanity, the balance of work and rest, marriage and the blessing of a helper, uh, the conditionality of life, that is the non-immortality of the soul, uh, the status of the remnant, redemption as a new creation, the coming Messiah, and the response of faith. Uh, to take the first one, the oneness of the sovereign God. In the ancient Babylonian creation account known as the Enuma Elish, gods themselves are the product of creation and are in turn agents of further acts of creation. Throughout the Old Testament, the active forms of the Hebrew verb bara always have the deity as their subject. The dividing line between the creator and the created is absolute in Genesis as in contrast to the Enuma Elish. As agents of the divine, created objects are ascribed no divine status, not even of an honorary kind. Sun and moon are not even named in Genesis 1, lest in written translation into Babylonian or Egyptian, the symbol of divinity be attached to them as a necessary part of customary spelling. It's an interesting uh, uh, perspective on that. They are simply called lights. Light itself is described as being created three days earlier, lest anyone or anything other than God himself be seen as the source of light. Stars do not ordain human destiny. Their creation is almost an afterthought to that of the two great light bearers. Sea monsters are not gods to be defeated, but the mere playthings of the one true God. Human beings alone are said to be created in the image of God, but this assertion does not mean that they are God. When they cross the boundary to become like God, gods, a tragic, ungodlike expulsion from the garden is what follows, not exaltation to divine status. As I might add in the uh, case of uh, Hercules and so forth. Is there any suggestion of the Christian doctrine of the Trinity here? None that is overt. However, the plural cohortative of Genesis 1.26 is tantalizing. Let us make man in our image. And I might add that since in uh, Hebrew there is a dual, this is actually three or more. One thing is clear. The New Testament asserts that Jesus is the agent of creation against the background 
of the Genesis Declaration of Creation as a divine act, and there are a few references. In so doing, it ascribes him full divinity. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. The very least that can be said is that he is seen as the visible manifestation of the transcendent Genesis creator. Yes. It is. Although it is interesting, there seems to be um, a little bit of a, um, uh, an ambiguity there because it is God saying, let us make man in our image. And then it goes ahead and says, so God made man in his image, which is singular. So, um, and, and in fact, the verb bara is singular in the Hebrew. Whereas if the subject was intended to be plural, there is um, actually a plural form. If I remember correctly, it's been a while, it would be bara u or something like that. Um, so that um, God is intended to be understood as singular, and yet at the same time you have this kind of plural council going on at the same, uh, at the same time. There's this plural form used when the creation acts are done, but w when you say when the created in the image, if all of the Godhead doesn't have an image to be created similar to, then I suppose you wouldn't want to use the plural form then. The, the other odd thing is that if you read, so God created man in his image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and in Hebrew parallelism, that implies that the male and female have to do somehow with the, um, uh, with the image of God, and therefore presumably reflects something in God. Uh, but, you know, that's pushing the text about as far as you can. There's a text in Galatians that escapes me at the moment, but the, the Greek word is boule, counsel. And I had a professor at PUC who suggested that the council was the Godhead determining what they were going to do in relation to the earth that uh, God the Father would remain on the throne, Jesus would come as he did, and the Holy Spirit would have its role. Uh, I don't know if you can read all of that into Boulet, but uh, interesting concept. Well, it, I think as, as he says, the very least you can say is that Jesus was, uh, in his preexistence, was involved in this. Um, from a Christian perspective, I, I think that's inescapable. And, and uh, Christians, I don't think, then, are allowed to treat Jesus as simply a man who had no pre-existence whatsoever. In the goodness of creation, he lists a number of good things, things that are mentioned in uh, Genesis 1, and uh, they were, and God saw that it was good, and God went on to do whatever. And, of course, the blessings of fruitfulness twice, once with the animals and the second time with humans. Then he goes on to say, there is no suggestion here that God is interested only in spiritual realities or even especially in them. He is interested in everything, in the totality of creation. The Black Death wiped out up to half of the European population in the 13th century, and can be ascribed in large part to an utter absorption in the spiritual at the expense of the physical. And of course, this is one thing that Adventists are strongly stressed, uh, stressing is that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and you can't just take the spiritual and then leave it separate from the physical. To see nature as an independent entity in which God takes an interest only once humans appear is equally fallacious. 
The words environs and environment relate to surroundings or neighborhoods. Environmentalism, therefore, does not adequately capture the concern of these verses. The created order does not have value simply because it provides the context for human life. It is a value of its own quite apart from human beings. Losses in the created order are intrinsic tragedies. The tragedy they bring on human beings is only part of the picture. Adam is a scientist before he is a husband. Yahweh God bringing the animals before him and seeming to wait with bated breath for what Adam will call them. So Adam does for the animals what God earlier does for the light and darkness in Genesis 1.5 and the expanse of the heavens. Notice they're taking the side that expanse is a proper translation of Rakia. Verse 8. Is this just a matter of classification or is Adam even assigning their function in the created order? There is no angel whispering the correct name in Adam's ear as in the Quran. Later, Noah becomes the first conservationist, of course, taking all the animals into the ark. The reality of cosmic conflict. Satan and demonic powers are mentioned little throughout much of the Old Testament. Belief in the existence of such beings has sometimes been seen as a late development in Jewish thinking. However, the notion of an opposing voice represents a challenge to a belief in a sovereign God. The wonder, therefore, is not that the Bible says so little about the opposing power, but that it says so much. The issue is, therefore, only repression rather than destruction. The serpent is fully identified as Satan and the devil in Revelation 12, 9, compare 22. It might seem a little anachronistic simply to read this understanding back into Genesis 3. Nevertheless, the question arises even here as to whether there is a power behind the serpent, albeit one ultimately as creaturely as he is. The Old Testament scholar John Salehammer perceptively comments, though the enmity may lie between the two seeds, the goal of the final crushing blow is not the seed of the snake, but rather the snake itself. His head will be crushed. In other words, it appears that the author seems intent on treating the snake and his seed together as one. What happens to the snake's seed in the distant future can be said to happen to the snake as well. This suggests that the author views the snake in terms that extend beyond this particular snake of the garden. The snake for the author is representative of someone or something else. In Genesis 3, there is plainly a personal power at enmity with the divine and his tools of trade range from deliberate exaggeration as God said that you can't eat of any of the trees of the garden, to outright lies, you certainly won't die, to statements that are technically true but have the wrong meaning in its mouth. Your eyes will be opened, but in shame, not delight. You will know good and evil, but in the sense of knowing blessing and curse, not in the sense of knowing everything. The temptation in the garden is clearly part of a larger, if as yet untold, tale. Next section, the sinfulness of humanity. As he goes on to say, if the first sin is stealing through fruit, Genesis 3, the second is fratricide, Genesis 4, 1 to 15, and soon bringing down vengeance for murder, actually it's for an insult, murder for insult, is something to be delighted in, verses 23 and 24. In short order, the whole earth is filled with violence to the extent that God himself is caught by surprise at the depth and persistence of human rebellion, or so it appears, if one takes the words of Genesis 6, 11, literally. The Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. The promise never again to curse the ground on account of man, Genesis 8, 21, appears to be based on a divine resignation to how inveterately evil human devising has become rather than on a, per, a compassion per se. As if to prove the point, Noah, it is stressed, is a righteous man blameless in his time, Genesis 6, 9. However, even he ends up drunk, Genesis 9, 21. And as uh, Cole mentions, <laughs> it's another bad use of fruit. 
the uh, <coughs> sins of Abraham, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, Laban, Rachel, Tamar, Jacob's sons, etc., are mentioned in the text. And then he goes on to say, as for people outside of Abraham's family, Sodom and Gomorrah are wiped out on account of their wickedness and depravity, and like the flood, become types of the end of the age. In Genesis, the Amorites have not yet filled up their cup of iniquity, but there is no doubt that fill it, they will. The balance of work and rest, and this is one that uh, Cole is particularly interested in, uh, as you may have noticed, uh, he's written a number of uh, texts on the Sabbath, including the one that I quoted earlier. In Genesis, work is clearly presented as a blessing, even in the unfallen state. It is then that humans are commanded to rule over other living creatures and subdue them, and Adam is placed in the garden to serve. And uh, the Hebrew word behind that is actually abad, from which we get evid, or slave. Um, however, from the beginning, there is provision for rest as well. There is no limitation to the divine power or exhaustion, but both the attenuation of time over work, that is, spreading out creation over six days, and the ceasing of work to rest when it is over, appear to be for the sake of humankind. In contrast to the situation in the Enuma Elish, where humans are created for no other reason than to give the gods rest while they slave away unceasingly. William Paley, famous for his theistic arguments from design, most of us are familiar with uh, that, ably put the case for the ongoing significance of creation ordinances, much and all as he believed the Sabbath was only instituted at the Exodus. He said, if the divine command was actually delivered at the creation, it was addressed, no doubt, to the whole human species alike and continues unless repealed by some subsequent revelation binding upon all who come to the knowledge of it. Marriage and the blessing of a helper. It is not good for the man to be alone. So Yahweh God th therefore makes a woman, a helper suitable for him, Genesis 2.18, or comparable to him, as the New King James Version puts it, or better still, a power equal to him, as David Noel Friedman argued. Um, the Genesis paradigm for male-female relationships hardly seems to match at all the values of the patriarchal culture through which the story has come to us. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, However, in ancient Israel, it was woman, women who left and the men who stayed. Yet herein we see the power of stories that transcend their setting to sow the seeds of change. The conditionality of life. In line with the Genesis emphasis on the goodness of creation, there is no hint of an incorporeal human existence before the creation. To the mind of the writer, incorporeal and human would be oxymoronic. The expulsion from the garden is precisely to ensure that humans in their sinfulness do not take from the tree of life and live forever. To claim that death is anything other than death is to repeat the serpent's lie. The genealogies throughout Genesis confirm like a drum roll the reality of death even when life is long. The status of the remnant. Enmity is placed between the seed of the women and the seed of the serpent as a whole. Uh, that's actually the way he wrote it. He uh, used the plural. Uh, yet there is a narrowing interest in a particular seed throughout Genesis. Cain's line is vanquished and Seth's line replaces it. Only Noah and his family survived the flood. Canaan is early removed from particular focus. Abraham becomes the person of special focus. Yet, in a point Paul delights to emphasize, Ishmael is not the child of promise, and Jacob inherits the birthright above Esau. In a process of time and in language anticipating Revelation 12, 17, the focus is always on a remnant of the woman's seed. Indeed, the root of the Hebrew verb used in Genesis 7.23, and only Noah was left, 
is identical to that of a nominal form, often translated Sha'ar, as remnant throughout the Old Testament. Reading the story of Genesis, a picture readily emerged of remnants who appeared concerned primarily for their own existence and little more. Do Pharaoh or Abimelech feel blessed by their encounter with Abraham? Or does Hagar, for that matter, at least in the short term? Simeon and Levi's slaughter of the Shechemites make Jacob odious among the inhabitants of the land. Joseph saves the Egyptians from famine, but they lose Yahweh's call, pardon me, but they lose their land to Pharaoh in the process. Yet in Yahweh's call to Abraham, it is promised that uh, he shall be a blessing and that in him all families of the earth shall be blessed. I think that's one that I mistyped. The tension between this introduction and what follows is profound. However, it might scarcely be noted if it were not for the extended introduction to the story of Abraham's family provided by Genesis 1 to 11. Abram, Abram's story is a divinely initiated counterbalance to what has threatened to be a global catastrophe and does not reach its ultimate fulfillment until reinterpreted in the New Testament. So it is ever when God works for the, with the particular. The selection of the particular is never an end in itself. And those of us who think we are part of the remnant should take this to heart, I think. It is always intended as a channel of blessing on a wider, even global scale. So the idea of a remnant soon becomes apparent in Genesis and may even have been in Jesus' mind when he spoke of the few ultimately being chosen. Redemption as a new creation. The flood is a reversal of creation, with the boundaries set on the second day between the waters above and the waters below now obliterated, and the separation between land and sea on the third day now nullified. Then the windows of heaven close again, the foundations of the deep, deep dry up, dry land re-emerges, and creation ordinances are reiterated for the new creation. The stage is set for the depiction of the Exodus as a new creation with a pillar of cloud regulating day and night and dry land emerging from the Red Sea. John depicts redemption as a new creation, the Gospel of John, opening with the same words as Genesis, in the beginning, speaking early of the light that shines in darkness and recounting later the cry of a completed work, it is finished. And the same new creation, by the way, can be seen in uh, the return from the exile. Without the grounding provided by the creation and flood accounts, it might be easy to think of the events along the way of the biblical narrative as random and disconnected. However, in the light of the Genesis record, the exodus, exile, and restoration become preludes to paradise restored. The end or the new beginning is not finally here until the tree of life is once again established among human beings. The coming Messiah. In Genesis 3.15, the Lord God promises to put enmity between the serpent and the woman and between his seed and her seed. Seed here no doubt ultimately represents their descendants as a whole. However, the seed of the woman is not said to defeat the seed of the serpent per se. It is the head of the serpent himself that the seed of the woman will crush. The suggestion is that of a personal one-on-one -on -one encounter or conflict, embodying the wider, more inclusive encounter. A particular messianic and unmistakably male individual appears to be in view here. Messianic hope is already well underway in the opening chapters of Genesis. Messianic hope also appears to be writ large in Genesis 49.10, where it is promised that the scepter, the symbol of kingship, will remain in Judah until Shiloh comes, or as the NIV translated, until he comes to whom it, that is tribute, belongs. 
the future appearance of a specific male ruler, a Messiah, is again in focus. Verse 11 stresses his wealth. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. And verse 12, his attractiveness. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Coming, commenting on verse 11, Victor Hamilton says, Tethering an ass to a vine, which the ass would readily consume, would be like lighting a cigarette with a dollar bill, or maybe with a 20 nowadays. Um, laundering one's clothing with wine might also point to opulence. It is clear that wine is not exactly the same as grape's blood. The first refers to the finished product. The second refers to the crushing of the grapes. May we have here a pastoral image, but within which there is the intimation of violence. To his own, this one will bring joy and fullness. To those who reject him, he brings terror. The response of faith. And he, Abram, believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Genesis portrays a wide-ranging picture of the scope of the divine intention for humanity. Paul will later describe Abraham's faith as unwavering. Given the fluctuations in Abraham's life, such an assertion can only reflect how faith is indeed counted for something more than its obvious meaning implies. Ishmael is clearly the result of a misdirected attempt to bring about the fulfillment of the divine promise, and this episode seems not to be the only such instance. Abraham's attempted manipulations of Pharaoh are not his finest hour. They leave him with wealth, but not the fulfillment of the promise. The attempts of Rebekah and Jacob to be deceive bear fruit in a lifetime of deceiving and being deceived. They certainly do not lead to a lifetime of family harmony or leadership. As Joseph plays games with his brothers, his, multi his motives may be multifaceted. Uh, did he want to get his brothers to bow down to him right away? So in these Genesis stories, a pattern certainly seems to be emerging. The divine promise is fulfilled by God and his sovereignty as the participants in the story trust in him. It is not fulfilled by human conniving, even by human striving. This is maybe a lesson for us as well. His conclusion is, what a rich perspective Genesis gives us for all that follows. Israel's God is no tribal God of a limited space. He is the eternal, transcendent, sole creator of all. Creation is good, and God is not just interested in, quote, spiritual, end quote, things. He's interested in everything, including how we care for his creation. The human drama is part of a large cosmic conflict between good and evil in which the very nature of truth is at stake. There's a profound inclination to sin in fallen human beings, one too profound for humans themselves to fix. Life is not all about work. It is also about rest and relationship. The Sabbath is no mere identity marker for Jews. It is a universal symbol of divine grace. No part of a human being is innately immortal, for life can only ever be a gift from God. We were not created to be alone, and marriage is a divine gift to human beings, not simply an institution of human devising. God works through shattered remnants, but not simply for their own sakes. They are his agents for a global salvation. Redemption is creation restored. The meta-narrative undergirding all biblical narratives is paradise lost and found again. The coming of the suffering yet triumphant Messiah is assured. Human conniving to assist the divine will is doomed to failure, as are all human attempts to earn either divine favor or the fulfillment of divine promise. Faith is the only appropriate response to the Creator. Such is the diverse and fundamental theological content of Genesis, briefly as it has been surveyed here. It is self-evidently foundational to the rest of the Bible, and therefore a fitting introduction to the canon of Scripture. James McCown concludes, 
and uh, the author obviously agrees with him. The book of Genesis has many interrelated themes and characters. It is well suited to be a book of beginnings, since many of these themes and characters are found throughout the Old and New Testament. Now, my take on this, I, I do agree with Dr. Cole. You can see where it fits into the defense of the scriptural story of Genesis. There is such a thing as propositional revelation. The text is reliable. The word speaks for itself. Genesis is theologically sound. Well, more than theologically sound, it, it really forms the undergrading for the rest of Scripture. Um, Genesis is ancient. Uh, Genesis describes a recent creation. Creation and biblical theology are mutually supportive. The New Testament supports the Genesis creation. Creation is more compatible with Jesus than evolution. And finally, they will discuss scientific arguments, ethics, and an attempt to make some kind of compromise. The book of Genesis gives the background for much of the theological emphasis of later books. I think he's amply demonstrated that, which is sometimes explicitly dependent on Genesis. When Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, he is assuming that there was a real Noah. Believing in Genesis allows us to sensibly believe these theological th themes and the evidence for them. Now, this line of reasoning cannot prove the actual authority of Genesis, because that would be circular. But it may help us to understand the stakes involved and to be careful about throwing out the authority of Genesis and especially the authority of the first 11 chapters. And with that, I will open the floor officially for comments and questions. Going back somewhat to last week on the question of evolutionists having ethics, I once met a man <clears throat> who to all appearances was a good man, a uh, good father, a good husband, Boy Scout leader, uh, Everything he did was, was right and proper, and he asked me what need he had of Christ because he was doing all these things. So I guess the question in my mind is can ethics be um, picked up from your society rather than inherent in humankind? Nurture versus nature. Um, may I suggest that, that the way uh, that the whole creation is put together is that trust is an integral component of, uh, of everything that's been built. And whether we recognize the creator or not, if we implicitly recognize this foundational truth, the importance of trust, then, uh, and, and recognize also the implications that flow from that, then we will ultimately discover that, that we're going to develop ethical principles um, naturally out of that. What I find difficult to harmonize with evolution is this very concept of trust. It does not belong in the evolutionary paradigm anywhere. Now, is it possible for somebody to intellectually uh, feel uh, uh, loyal to evolution, but on a gut level, implicitly accept trust as a reality that cannot be challenged? Of course. And so it is possible to, to have an intellectual adherence to something, but a personal uh, inner uh, relationship that doesn't correspond to that intellectual 
<laughs> dogma. Similarly, with us, it is possible that intellectually we could be loyal to God, but if somehow on a gut level we subscribe to taking advantage of someone else as a way to get ahead or to impose our will or any of those things, what we're in effect doing is we're subscribing to the evolutionary paradigm whether we are conscious of it or not. Uh, we're essentially supporting the evolutionary paradigm by uh, our actions, by our gut, even if intellectually we're adhering to, oh, uh, Genesis and whatnot. I'd like to make a little observation between last week and this week. Last week, we brought up a question about something specific. It was about the ethics from God versus the ethics that come from nowhere. Today, you know, it was kind of driving me crazy because he was writing very safely. He used the, the article, uh, on all of his concepts. It's just like saying, Where, what, what direction is Seattle? And you say, this way. And um, instead of saying, well, I, what I wanted to know is what was the direction, not what is a direction. And it seems like it went in something stuff, more, more than just north, which gives you a, a right. 90 degree angle. If you, if you go through all the stuff you've read, he uses a lot of the article A, you know, as in when the article A is used, you know, this is a grammar thing. Um, it's not specific. Whereas when you use the, it's specific. And when people start discussing things with that article, the, the, well then it seems like discussions come up, flare up more because you're talking more specific. And uh, I, so I just kind of noticed that, that that was very safe writing today. And it's probably what you learn to do when you get your master's. <laughs> There's a certain amount of truth to that. Notice I used A. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I, I think that this, that this gets into a conflict um, that Christians are often loath to deal with because it looks like a lose-lose proposition. If you say to this wonderful Boy Scout leader, well, um, no, your ethics actually are, are Christian ethics to begin with, uh, and you got them without having to ha surrender your life to Jesus Christ, then it sounds like surrendering your life to Jesus Christ doesn't matter. Or, or that it's almost worth the cost. Um, on the other hand, if you say, no, you're really not good enough, um, then it sounds like you're being very, very exclusionary. No matter wh how good you are, what you do, um, you know, if you don't acknowledge the name of Jesus, you're, you're not going to be saved. And that, quite frankly, is pretty much indefensible when you start looking at the margins. That is to say, the Bereans who were good Jews before they, or perhaps good Gentile students before they heard from the Apostle Paul about the story of Jesus, if they died in that state, are they saved? Well, it's pretty hard to say no. Um, and it's pretty hard to not s say yes, even after Jesus' death made a difference. So what do you do when you're caught in that kind of a, a, a difficulty? And that's, that's the problem that your example gives. And it raises a question, what is salvation for anyway? I guess we have a question back here. I guess I would want to know what, what our assumption of good is. 
because in Jesus' time there was definitely an assumption of what was right and good. And when he came along, he totally destroyed the idea of what is good. Of course, there are certain things we can all agree on as being good, selflessness and so forth, as was mentioned. But I think people can do things that we would say good in society or good within the church, but looking at it from Jesus' perspective or from God's perspective, it may not in fact be good. So I don't know if, if, if our focus on being, how do we get to goodness, is really the, the point. Maybe the focus is how do we get to God, because by doing that we then become truly good in the sense that Jesus is good. Comment here. Uh, it reminds me of that parable uh, that Jesus talked about two sons whom the father sent into his field to work. And one said, okay, but didn't go. And the other one says, no. But then decided he was going to go anyway. And then Jesus asked an important question. <laughs> Who did the father's bidding? <laughs> and then he followed it up with an important statement. The publicans and sinners are going to go in ahead of you. And that was like telling so them that, you know, the, the, the prostitutes down the street and the drug addicts, they're, they've got it in ahead of you. So is it Ooh. possible that some evolutionists might get to kingdom before us? Well, it, it certainly sounds that way. Uh, you know, I think maybe there is an important point that, that, uh, uh, that will that should be brought up in this context when somebody asks that kind of a question. And that is to say, are you willing to admit when you're wrong? And the reason I bring that up is because every single one of us in this room, myself included, has some wrong ideas. And our getting to the kingdom is going to be dependent on our willingness to give those up when the evidence gets strong enough against them. If we're not willing to do that, then we have pride of our ideas that, is, that will keep us out of the kingdom because God can't correct us unless we're willing to be corrected. Um, in the parable, which as I understand it is actually not a true parable, but perhaps a actually Jesus seeing this happening and commenting on it. There's a Pharisee who says, you know, I've done all these things. And there's a publican who said, God be merciful to me, a sinner, basically admitting I've blown it and you're the only one that can help. The first two steps of the 12-step 12, 12 program, by the way. And Jesus goes on to say, this man went justified to his home. That's the word that we all fight about, you know. Dikaiao is a justification by faith, righteousness by faith, all of those things you've heard about. When Jesus talks about it, he says, the important thing is that you're willing to admit that you're wrong. And if you can do that, I have no problem with the atheist being in heaven because when he runs into God, he's going to say, oops, I guess I blew it. <laughs> um, whereas, you know, if he can't do that, he's going to be miserable because he's got to keep denying what he said at one time uh, he didn't believe in. Uh, in the teeth of the evidence. And that'll make for a miserable existence. God wouldn't want him there, m being miserable that way. You know, the, the key to Peter being there is not that he is Jesus' disciple. The key to Peter being there is the willingness to say, that was a dumb thing to do. And I always made an appeal of some sort at the end of a sermon and over the years many sinners 
came to God. But I don't recall ever a conference official or even a head elder uh, coming to God in those circumstances. So there must be a level of good to which we uh, ascribe. <laughs> However, Scripture says bluntly, there, there is no one, not, not one good. And reading all these statements by Ellen White, she continually says, not one in a hundred, not one in twenty, not one. That means none. So there has to come, I think, a recognition, and it comes by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that in fact you are not good. And in fact, you need a change. And then there's the old-fashioned, you know, falling on the rock of Christ, the, the heart change that we don't hear much about anymore. It's better to become an Adventist by profession of faith than to go through all that embarrassing uh, ritual. But the Holy Spirit will tell you whether you're but good or not. Becoming an Adventist by profession of faith is only supposed to happen because the person went through all that ritual to begin with uh, as a Baptist. I recently worked with a lady who became an Adventist by profession of faith. She was an Episcopalian. Not much evidence of change in her from before and after becoming an Adventist, but given her uh, Presbyterian background, it was quite acceptable for her to join the church by profession of faith. She was a Christian. That's all that was needed. But, but many of the other uh, Christian denominations also have baptism by immersion, even if, even if they do not require it. Well, the, the point is uh, even not, although, although technically we do try to get, encourage people to follow the Savior's example, of course, we as Adventists never claimed, um, at least most of us, um, that salvation is only of the Adventist church. Um, but it's, it seems like we have to be we have to be careful to say that no, uh, what is necessary is not really baptism so much as the surrender of your life to God. Amen. And that's really where the key is. And that's why I say if, if this man has surrendered his life to the truth as he knows it and is willing to follow that anywhere he, he, uh, it leads him, I am quite sure that uh, God is capable of leading him where he needs to go. On the other hand, if he is maintaining that I'm good enough to do it alone, he's in for a rude surprise in a number of different ways. A couple different things. The, I think Christ expanding on the law addresses that for if you hate your brother, you've murdered him, et cetera, if you lust and you've committed adultery and so forth. So that I think that for an individual to s say that they're good enough, that you're simply ascribing themselves a ranking among others, as a looking to other people and saying, well, I'm better than them and therefore I'm good enough as opposed to holding a higher standard. The second thing is there's an inconsistency of worldview that bothers me with, with um, with being an evolutionist or an atheist and then having to deal with what the origin of, of morals are and what the origin of right and wrong. Why would you say you're good enough if you have no moral basis for what's good or bad? You have no absolute for a basis for that. Then there is no reason for you to say that you are good under an evolutionary theory. You don't have a basis for that because what is good without that absolute moral standard. Well, the, the question might be asked of somebody who believes in a God, but just not sure that Christianity is correct. And so they would have an absolute. They would They're have an absolute. They're just not sure that the, the, you have to believe in Christ in order to yeah, one can actually believe in an absolute good. It's tough. And I think that evolutionary theory makes it tougher because 
you know, the way ahead at one time was survival of the fittest, a pure, unmitigated selfishness with the only, well, the only mitigation being that you also can accept uh, your kin being part of it. Um, and then, and then you move on somehow to how we're supposed to be cooperative. It's interesting because you can hear Richard Dawkins wrestle with this very problem. And he recognizes it as a problem. Um, uh, sometimes we sell these people a little short because they don't see our, everything our way. Um, but they do actually recognize some problems. And they try, I think somewhat ineffectively, but they do try to deal with it. Two things. Uh, the, um, the hypothetical case that came up, it sounds like um, if, if one has a good set of ethics and moral values and moral behaviors, they can make it and fit in with society during this life, but there is an afterlife. And that's what that part doesn't fix. And even recognizing one is wrong isn't I don't think adequate according to the scriptures, it is recognizing that there is one that has taken your place and has done right in your behalf and asking for that to be placed to your account. So that's at least how I see it. Um, without that, your life is your life and when it's over, you'll have to, if you didn't accept, then you won't be accepted. And the other thing, I had a question about um, in th this, this chapter on, Genes on Genesis was really enlightening to me that it is such a profound introduction to the Bible. And I'm wondering, was it the beginning of even the Hebrew literature? Because I know they organized uh, their, their writings in a different way than the Bible has it now. In the traditional, to take the second question first, in the traditional way of looking at things, um, Genesis was one of the first two books written, the other one being Job. And it's debatable as to which one came first, but if Genesis, in fact, is reliant on uh, even older records, uh, which uh, I think will be argued in one of our future chapters, uh, then Genesis is, in fact, the very first uh, material we have in Hebrew. It's uh, now 1130, and so uh, I, I know some of you need to be elsewhere. But we'll continue for a little bit longer. Um, the, the one other thing I would point out is this, that there are a lot of people who are going to be saved who have no clue as to who Jesus is or what he's done. Because uh, in some cases, they lived before Jesus' life or death. And while you can see prophecies that sometimes point in that direction, I have my doubts as to whether everybody clearly understood all of the prophecies. Um, Certainly the disciples didn't seem to understand them, nor did the Pharisees at the beginning. Um, two of the probably closest students of the prophecies. So that I don't think it is necessary to understand a full view of atonement in order to be saved. To take the example of the publican again, God be merciful to me, a sinner, is an adequate prayer. And it has two parts, neither one of which deal with Jesus' substitutionary atonement. Number one, I am a sinner. Number two, God is the only person that can help. That's all that's really required. Uh, in fact, I would go so far as to say that when people reach out to a higher power, they know not what that God sees that and honors it. Um, here and then back there. Yeah, I was just going to add to that that there will be people who will be saved who've never heard of 
God or Jesus. They've just responded to the good that they've seen in their in their life, and and um, they will be saved because of that. I think it's unfortunate that we we have no problem with the child that died before they heard of Christ or the people before. I'm afraid there's a whole lot of people all around us who have not had Christ represented to them adequately. They may have heard of Christianity, but I had an article in a, from a, a group that I actually like a lot and like the work they're doing, but they had an article in a recent magazine about why eternal hell, which is one of the biggest things I see atheists list as their reason for not believing in a God. And this pastor was going on and on in circular reasoning, trying to explain why a God which quotes is so holy, he's so holy that he has to torture these people forever. And it made no sense, and yet I'm afraid that there are an awful lot of people that, that in the scientific community also that have heard of Christianity, but what they have heard is not Christianity or not our Lord and our Savior and the loving God that we serve. And so they may reject Christianity, but not reject God only because they've never met God or Christ as we know him. And that's probably should point to us to try and demonstrate that in a loving fashion. They are essentially rejecting a misrepresentation. So it and sometimes I'm very to tempted that. to say to them when this discussion comes up, and occasionally do, well, you know, I don't believe in that God, kind of God either. <laughs> I was intrigued by the... Um, one of the points he made is God's purposes will come to fruition without man's conniving. And he specifically referred to Ishmael and Abraham and the, this promised son. And I've always grappled with that story. To me, it's one of the more puzzling stories in the Old Testament is why did God wait till Abraham was 100 years old? What is the point of this? Well, but how is it, uh, he how wanted, is it a, I think, how is it a test of faith when all you do is get old? He wanted to make it absolutely clear to Abraham and everyone else that when this baby comes, this was his baby, not Abraham's baby. Well, you think of Isaac. I mean, Isaac was one of the patriarchs, but what great, what great things did Isaac accomplish? Did he, he didn't. The Bible doesn't really talk much about him. It says he liked, he favored his son Esau, the hunter, and uh, he had two boys. And uh, he didn't, to my mind, he didn't accomplish any great thing. And so I'm back to this story. Why did God wait? I mean, there's lots of people that were infertile in the Bible, and God clearly gave them children, but he didn't wait till they were 100 years old to do it. I have a feeling there's something really deep in this story. There's an awful lot of symbolism. The problem of the Messiah is coming through this this boy. Abraham's the father, but he really isn't the father. I mean, um, so I, I, I liked what he said about God's purposes being shown to be God's in control without man's man's help. I think there's some deep theological meanings behind that. Well, I, you, know, you, you see this all the way through the Old Testament in very strange places. For example, the Israelites are told, okay, you're going to take the land of Canaan. So this God says, I'll do it. Watch those hornets. I'm going to send them and those guys are going to clear out. So the Israelites send spies to find out how the land is. And two of the spies looked at it and said, wow, this is a great place. And you know, we can do this. But God on our side. Um, the other ten says, you're kidding. We look like grasshoppers. You know, <laughs> we're just waiting to be smushed. And both sides, although the second more than the first, missed the point. Giants don't like hornets any more than the rest of anybody does. <laughs> That was God's job to drive them out. And it's interesting that people repented afterwards, you know, when they realized, oops, we blew it. And they said, okay, let's go, let's go. God says, don't go. It's not going to work. 
and they went and it didn't work. And you catch this idea that God wanted people of faith to be willing to go in when it was his time, not their time. Um, you, have, you have occasional demonstrations of this same kind of faith where Jehoshaphat is coming after a whole host of enemies. And God says, Let's, I'll give you the victory. Because you won't even have to fight. So somebody got the bright idea, well, if we're not going to even have to fight, why don't we put the choir in front of the army? So they did. And they went down singing psalms as they went down, you know, and they got to the battlefield. It was all done. That's the way God wants to have it. That we basically, we pick up the pieces afterwards. And I sometimes think we are so desperately trying to get things right. And we're trying, and we oftentimes cut corners even in order to make it happen. It's not our job to do that. It's our job to react faithfully to what God has. Amen. And I think we, we need to be careful when we run into difficulties within our church that we don't do the same kind of thing. That we, that we are very careful not to try to take God's place in the fight. Because, you know, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Anyway, I think there's a comment up here. I was just, just going to say that I think sometimes God wants to show the universe, too, uh, that this person really did have faith, and I think that's why he waits sometimes. There, there's to, probably a lot of consent. truth to that, and it really took a while before Abraham could finally demonstrate his faith. And that's, by the way, the reason why Abraham finally wound up having to be... God never intended to put Abraham to quite that hard of a test. But he'd already blown it so many other times that he probably pretty much had to demonstrate, no, Abraham really does have this kind of faith. No, the, what you were speaking about with the God wanting to have his way without us trying to help him. Uh, the remnant, which was mentioned here, seems to be, at least in my mind, those people who are responding and who are willing to listen as God works through them. Uh, but it, it, it would seem to me, as people who claim to be the remnant, that the worst thing that we could do is try to help God fulfill his purpose for us if we believe we are the remnant, are part of the remnant. Um, and yet I think we do that a lot as a church. Um, and maybe me as an individual member of the church to say this is what we should be doing or what we ought to, how we ought to be when we, instead maybe what we should be doing is letting God do with us what he will. Um, and it may not look the way we expect it to. I don't know. I, I think I agree with that. Just a minute here. Sorry. I was wondering if Israel, after the spies returned back from their mm, seeing out the land of Canaan, uh, when they came back to their own people, if Israel with Moses came to the uh, sanctuary and said, let it be unto us as the Lord has decided. Kind of very much like what Mary said when an angel came to her to tell her that she's going to have a child out of wedlock. You know what I'm saying? Would they still be wandering for 40 years? I suspect not. But because they chose the hard route, God had to accommodate them. Strangely, God accommodates our reluctance because he, we don't give him a choice. 
But he would pick a better choice, without doubt. I mean, he's wise enough. If I can draw it back one more time to the, uh, to the discussion. Genesis has such a rich theological content. And it's important to remember that if you reject it as history, you have to either insist that non-historical tales are worth that kind of study. Basically, you do th theology on the story of Santa Claus, kind of. Or else you have to reject the th you have to reject that as the basis for that theology at all. And I'm not saying that that proves that Genesis is true. But I think it does give us a great deal of pause before we reject the story. And I think that for those of us who do believe it's true, this is actually an important chapter because it draws out the meaning of what it is to say that Genesis is in fact true. It's saying that all those implications that are in there are true. Mm. Uh, I would just add to that that uh, when you reject Genesis, you're not just rejecting Genesis. You're rejecting the authority and the integrity of other usually accepted uh, personalities in the Bible that refer to Genesis as though it's true. It's, uh, it's uh, the, the flood is often referred to, not always, but it's by, you know, Paul and uh, uh, Peter and uh, Christ and so on, and uh, uh, creation. You're saying that the whole structure of the Gospel of John is based on a myth. Yeah, th th this is, um, th so it, it's, uh, it's not easy to reject Genesis. One more comment. Eh? You said you might discuss what you were discussing earlier before the class started about Ben Carson. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> well, I, I think that the observation was made that the, uh, the response was uh, disproportionate to the stimulus, suggesting that there was some other stimulus going on. And uh, it's always interesting to speculate on, on why people would take a guy like Gentle Ben and, and say that uh, well, he's a creationist, so he shouldn't speak here. Uh, oops, I mean, um, he can speak here, but nobody else like him should ever speak here. Just don't invite them so that we don't have to object. Um, and various speculations were raised as to why. Uh, my own personal speculation is that I think some of these people are afraid of Christian Reconstructionists and see them behind every bush. Uh, and the scary part of it is that what's happening is they're driving moderates into the arms of those people. Uh, and I think that they may be creating the very response that they think they're trying to get rid of. Um, because Once, once you get lumped in with those people, there's a temptation to say, well, you know, they can't be that bad uh, because that's where they're pigeon. If, if I've got to choose between your way and their way, I'd rather have their way. Um, I think that Adventists in particular have very good reason to worry about Christian Reconstructionism. It sounds an awful lot like the kind of thing that Adventists have preached against and about as one of the final movements. You know, the idea that, that, that Christians will try to make America a Christian nation and kind of blur the finer points of, you know, what do you do with the Sabbath, what do you do with things like that. 
And so, yeah, you know, I'm worried about it. Um, but I'm also aware that there's a huge amount of Christianity that is not involved in that. And that, um, and that it, yelling at people like they're all part of that movement is probably counterproductive. <coughs> and, and yet you see people like uh, Barbara Forrest in particular was just totally uh, sure that friends of friends of people who claim to be Christian Reconstructionists and without actually going into the details of what they were wanting to do, um, were all part of the same bunch. And that's... Uh, I've never even heard this term until today. What is this? Uh, well, look it up on the internet. <laughs> that's <laughs> one of the things about uh, the, the life today is that uh, there is nothing that can be kept secret anymore, at least well kept. And Were um, any of the faculty against Ben Carson coming? Because I'm just wondering, well, who thought of inviting him and weren't any of these evolutionists <coughs> in on the decision to invite him? And so how did he get invited if there were so many <laughs> well, who didn't I think want him there? I think the faculty heard, oh, this is a wonderful guy, you know, he's black, he comes from the ghetto, he basically kind of pulled himself up by his bootstraps, uh, although if you listen to him, obviously that's not quite accurate. It, uh, there was his mother and his God that between the two of them did a lot for him. And, um, and now he's become a philanthropist as well, you know, I mean, he had several foundations trying to help kids to read, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, just a wonderful all-around person, really accomplished scientist, you know. If you have Siamese twins that are joined at the head, if you want anybody to operate on them right now, it would be Ben Carson. That's just the facts. Um, wonderful story. And they had never heard of this Adventist stuff that was on the internet. And I'm sure what happened was that somebody put a bug in somebody's ear. Hey, do you want this guy? <coughs> and um, I suspect that the biology professors at first were going, no, you can't have this guy. And then they realized, do you realize who you're dealing with? This is Ben Carson. You can't treat him like that. And so they suddenly kind of got cold feet and said, oh no, it's okay if he speaks. We just don't want anybody else speaking. And they arranged for that not to happen. Um, but there are people around who see things in that kind of black and white. Either you believe or you don't believe, and if you don't believe, you don't have any business in academia. And the fact that Ben Carson is even there is an insult to them. So it, it bugs them. Uh, they couldn't do anything. Um, we, we tend to be constructionists, I think, because there are sociological uh, factors. We like to be, you know, sometimes it's, you know, us versus them. We, uh, I mean, talk about Republicans and Democrats as an example. I mean, it's, uh, we tend to organize ourselves into this. And, uh, I th but I think this is, we need to avoid this. Uh, I don't know what happened in Ben Carson's case, uh, but I do know that uh, we deal with a God who is relentlessly trying to redeem everybody, and we need to look at every person as a potential uh, candidate for redemption, not as an enemy. And th this is a whole yeah. different attitude than we, that our human nature uh, mm -hmm. doesn't look at, but it's what our wonderful God tells us now. Uh, when I was at the University of Michigan, uh, that university and the department I'd been in had, uh, I didn't know this when I applied there, and I didn't know Ellen White said you should not go there unless you have a strong faith, but uh, <laughs> two Adventists have been asked to leave. Uh, 
in that department. And then they discovered they had another Adventist there who was me. And everything was okay except some person, was a constructionist, I don't know, sent an Adventist book, Biology, the Story of Life, written by Ernest Booth, that promoted creation. Those, those of us who are old enough remember that book. Uh, <laughs> sent it to the department. And so the department started to say, hey, what are we going to do with this Arnold Roth here uh, in our department thing? And uh, the uh, professor of evolution called me in. And he says, now look, uh, we realize you can believe what you want to. Uh, but it is our position here that we are not to put out a, per a person like Ernest Booth, who wrote that book, we are to put out a scientist. And then he said, what, what are your questions? Uh, what are your beliefs about evolution and so on? You know, I told him, well, I, I can say, I can follow your reasoning to a certain extent, but if I go down that reasoning, I run into trouble. Uh, Mention the turtle. Uh, for instance, uh, how could the turtle skeleton, you know, uh, appear all of a sudden with such a complete change in the whole anatomy of from its ancestors and so on and this type of thing. You know, that, uh, if I remember correctly, the turtle has its shoulder girdle inside the ribs where everybody right. else has it outside the ribs. Right, all of the vertebrates. And it's, uh, it's a major job to move a shoulder girdle from the outside to the inside, as you'd have to in this. I mean, you and, have to and how do you do that? By little tiny steps. Little tiny, and you leave no fossil record, of course. Uh, which is, but uh, so I, I mentioned that I mentioned other things. You know, how could warm-blooded animals ever evolve when cold-blooded animals are so much more adapted to their environment? They don't have to get all this extra food and all this stuff and so on. And, you know, and after about twenty minutes, he says, he "says You're okay." Why? I talked his language. I stayed in the scientific realm. And I thank God I got through that university. They, they told me, you know, uh, a couple weeks before I was through, they told me, yeah, Errol, the only reason you're getting a degree out of this university is that we could not decide about what to do with you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I had thought I'd written a good dissertation, a good research project. So I, but anyway, that's just a, just a little aside there. How many Adventists have they let come since you? I don't know. Uh, I, I, I haven't heard of any, but then uh, uh, it, uh, it, uh, I thank God I got through there. And, and my major professor was tolerant and understanding, and uh, we discussed things quite freely at times and so on. But uh, uh, he wasn't actually sure about evolution himself, I don't think, uh, which uh, helped tremendously. But. The, that department, there were 32 members in the faculty there, and they, they were split right down the middle. Uh, one, any position one side took, the other took the opposite, and I, I, I escaped in the controversy. Is that shades of Paul and the Sanhedrin or something? <laughs> if they'd known he was going to teach creationism for his whole professional life, <laughs> I think they would have regretted their decision. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we will uh, see you again next week.